good morning and welcome to the Navigators Bible class. We are studying geography and the more we know about Bible geography, the more we can understand things in the scripture and Bible geography is going to be important if we, uh, when, when people study the second coming of the Lord, there is actually a geographical path that he will take as he comes back and goes through the nations. And uh, the Exodus is a key to that. Several places in the Old Testament says, as it were in the days in which you came up out of Egypt, so shall it be in the days and the context is the second coming. So uh, the Exodus gives us a hint uh, into those things. <clears throat> but we hope that is this thing not working? There we go. We hope that you endure Bible geography as a good student. <laughs> I know some people think, well, I had that elementary school. Anyway, here's a review from last week. We didn't have this. You didn't have this. Okay, well, that's good in a way, I guess. Uh, last week we looked at the activities at the Red Sea camp. We'll review them a little bit. Remember, they stopped at the Red Sea camp, and they were there for eight days and wondering why are we not leaving and Pharaoh finally caught up with them with his armies and sometimes God asks us to wait for reasons we don't understand but God was setting up Pharaoh and his armies for their defeat and this enabled the Israelites to see how God was working. So <clears throat> then we talked about the crossing of the Red Sea at the um, at the Straits of Tehran. <clears throat> then they enter the wilderness of Shur, and that's on your map. Do you still have your little map with you? That, yep. that thing? It's, yeah. It should be the same as the picture here or similar to it if you have the black and white version. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at them as they begin on their way to Mount Sinai. And this area is still referred to by locals as the Way of Moses. You know, ask them, what, what is this? They call it the Way of Moses. These are the people that are living there right now are still calling it that. Some of them, you know. Uh, but before we get into this today... I want us to take a quick look at the Gulf of Aqaba, the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, the Red Sea, uh, we always say it looks like you're holding up two fingers like this, because you got the main part of the Red Sea here, and then you got this part, which is the Gulf of Suez, and you have this part here, which is the Gulf of Aqaba. And between it is what? Sinai Peninsula. Right? Okay. <coughs> and people wonder how come uh, many of the maps that we have, even currently in the back of our Bible, have many of the places that are... Um, over here, they misplace them and put. They misplace them, and they put them in here. They some people put the uh, Mount Sinai in here, and if you put Mount Sinai in here, you also have to put Kadesh Barnea in there, and you have to put the Wilderness of Shur in there. And so what they do is that they take a lot of stuff that's supposed to be here, and they put them over here. Why do you suppose that 
happened. Now we're going to look at it. I'm going to run some maps by you fairly quickly. Yes, sir. Why would God have to part the Red Sea if it was there? Right. Exactly. Yes, sir. Where's the Reed Sea? The Reed Sea is way up here. Reed Sea is way up here, and and that is something that is uh, often mistaken for the Red Sea, and it uh, is very shallow. Sometimes people can walk across it even today. That's what the discoverer says that they broke. Right. Um, anyway, why do people mistake? The, the areas that are we know to be here, and Scripture says that it's here. This is Arabia over in this area, and Paul clearly states that Mount Sinai is in Arabia, that Midian is in Arabia, that the Ishmaelites settled in Arabia, and Arabia is not over here. So how did they get that messed up? When people started making maps, what do they call them? Car car uh, cartographers. Cartographers or something. When they started, and that's easy for you, isn't it? Uh, when they started making maps, uh, you, you've seen some of these old maps that were, we look at them and say, well, that's pretty hokey. <laughs> How did they come up with that? Or they must have been half blind. Well, <clears throat> most of the maps that you see were made by European explorers. And I'm going to show you a, co a couple of them. Here is the Gulf of Aqaba right here. And when the uh, I don't know why that keeps going back there. When the uh, when the sailors came up the Red Sea here, the Gulf of Aqaba was almost hidden. That, that's very hard to see from this area, and it certainly was likely not navigable by ocean-going vessels who were bringing supplies in from you know, India or wherever. And uh, they just avoided that or, or didn't even have that in their charts. Uh, if you look at this chart here, which is late 1500s, you see the Gulf of Aqaba is not even there. It's not on this chart. This is a Mare uh, Rubrum, which is Latin for Red Sea. Okay. Um, and, and this is how they thought it looked. They, they would sail straight in to up to the very top because it was deep and they could unload their goods there. They didn't even consider this over here. They didn't know it was there. And until aerial photography came into existence, the Gulf of Aqaba was almost not known. Now it was known to locals, but they were not sailing these deep ocean going uh, uh, ships um, like Columbus had. You know? um, here's another one. You see the Red Sea coming up here? Look what they've got over here. Sinai. Sinai. And Midian, they got those on. The reason why they put some of these biblical places where they do and in your maps, in your Bible, was because when they located them originally, they didn't even have the Gulf of Aqaba on their maps. So when later in the 1900s, when the Gulf of Aqaba began to be put on the maps, and they put it out here like this, then they left all the stuff here, like Mount Sinai, and the wilderness of Shur, and Kadesh Barnea, and all that stuff. Look at this right here. That 
and that's Avalon, which is Arabia. They thought Arabia came all the way up here. And this was in 1598. You see the date on that? 1598. Um, here's another one, Mare Rubrum, the Red Sea. This is uh, uh, an Italian chart, and it's kind of <laughs> tilted to the side, so you got to look at it like that. But if you notice the white area, that's the deep part that goes all the way up to the top of the Suez, uh, Gulf of Suez. This was not known as the Gulf of Suez. It was part of the Red Sea. And the Gulf of Aqaba, which would be over here, is not even on the charts. Uh, look at this map here. Uh, this one shows kind of a world map. And there is the Red Sea, straight up, no Gulf of Aqaba. And the same with this one here. This was 1625. The Mayflower had already landed at Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, was it? Wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. Yeah, in 1620. Columbus had already, and this was what, 100, 120, 130 years after Columbus. So they were navigating the globe, and yet they had not discovered the Gulf of Aqaba. And they, and so the areas in here that were called the biblical names just stayed there when they added the Gulf of Aqaba. Again, this is the Gulf, and this is where they crossed a very narrow and probably at that time shallow area. So the <coughs> That, that the Israelites did not have to go down 200 feet and then come up 200 feet. It was fairly level as they went across. The wall of water still pushed back and they went across from dry land. Okay, I hope that helped give you a concept of why <clears throat> these biblical geographical locations have been misplaced. And if they read Galatians, they would know that uh, Mount Sinai was in Arabia, and Arabia was never, never in the Sinai Peninsula. Okay. Hope that helped. Yes, thank you. Okay. We see in Exodus 15 that they arrived in Mara. Remember, they crossed over the Red Sea there, and they are in the wilderness of Shur, and in chapter 15, verse 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Notice, he speaks of them as Israel now. They are a nation. After they left Egypt, they were now a nation, not just a family. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur. <clears throat> That's the same place where Hagar uh, fled toward when Ishmael, uh, when she had Ishmael, and they kind of got kicked out of the, uh, of, of the tent there with Abraham's family. Um, Anyway, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they got to Marah, in verse 23, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah, which was, which means bitter. Now, here's the uh, map. If you look, they come, they come into the wilderness of Shur. In three days, they come to Marah, <clears throat> the waters of bitter. What likely was their problem <clears throat> was the fact that the water was brackish, uh, which means it's part salt water and part fresh water, and they couldn't drink it. There are places like that all over the world <clears throat> where they seem to be inland, but there's, there, it's not fresh, it's brackish. And we know what happened there that uh, 
they began to murmur. <laughs> this is the second go around as murmuring takes place in verse 24. The people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Uh, and then the, verse 25, Moses cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast in the waters, the waters were made sweet. Again, that's a miracle, a miracle. And there he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And after, the, after this miracle comes another promise. It is a conditional promise in verse 26. And, and he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, couple of ifs there, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which have brought uh, upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Much of what comes in the law is to help keep them from getting diseases that not only the Egyptians had, but the Canaanites had. When they went into Canaan, they were to avoid intermarrying with the Canaanites. They were to, to destroy them. One of the reasons <clears throat> is that they were a diseased people. And um, many of this were <clears throat> sexually transmitted diseases and populations were just just diseased diseased and we understand that keeping God's moral law uh, is important not just to obey the Lord but our own health is that way um, you remember when uh, AIDS first came about um, <clears throat> AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Do you know what its first name was? GERD. GERD. Gay-Related Immune Deficiency, or GRIT. Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. That's what it was called. And that was not a politically correct <clears throat> name, so they changed it. <clears throat> I don't have to go into any more details or whatever, but those that stand fast on the scriptures and obey the Lord's moral, thank you, that obey the Lord's commands and his principles will avoid these diseases. I am so sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> the voice was better earlier, I guess, the longer I talk, the worse it gets. <clears throat> oh, goodness, I just found my red pencil I've been looking at. For that, and it was stuck way over here in Deuteronomy. Oh, man. <laughs> You'd think I'd see that with all the flipping around. And they left Mara and they arrived at Elam. Look at verse 27, chapter 15. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Um, this was on day 29 and the fifth day from the crossing and that was about 12 miles from Mara, Elam. It is still an oasis today and you can see some of the places where there were um, springs there. It's not the same as it was back then, but the places. Anybody been there to see that? I know some of you have been in the area. Um, 
here's our map again. They went to Mara, they went to Elam. And the next place they go is to the Red Sea camp. Now you have to go over to Numbers 33, Numbers 33 to see this in verse 10. It says they removed from Elam and encamped by the Red Sea. This was the second Red Sea camp. There are those that miss this because they don't go to Numbers to get it. This is actually not mentioned or recorded in Exodus. But in Numbers, it records the fact that they, after they went to Elam, they camped by the Red Sea. And um, this was the Red Sea camp here. Now, this a guy has placed it down here. It could have been anywhere in this area, really. Um, and it might have stretched a good deal um, in through this area. But anyway, that was where they went after they went to Elam. And um, <clears throat> from Elam, uh, from the Red Sea camp, after they broke camp, they go to the wilderness of sin. The wilderness of sin. You see that in Numbers 33, verse 11. It says, And they removed from the Red Sea and encamped in the wilderness of sin. They were there six to seven days. Um, they arrived there on day 31. By the way, when you see a day 31, it's in reference to when they left Goshen, that was day one. So they have been 27 days, and they arrive here on, uh, not 27, 30, 31. They arrive at, in the wilderness of sin in this area. Now, wilderness, when you see that term, wilderness, it's a place that man has not cultivated, and it's generally uninhabited and usually inhospitable. We have wildernesses in our country. A lot of them are wooded wildernesses, but people are not cultivating the area nevertheless. Um, so we see many wildernesses in that area. Keep in mind the population then was not what it is today because many of these areas that we see today have civilizations in them now. They have uh, water systems, reclaimed water. I used to tune a piano for a guy who designed reclaimed water systems for uh, companies that worked in the Middle East. He was a very wealthy man, <laughs> I will say this. but. Uh, at this point, there, there are uh, no souls living in this area, as it was called the wilderness. Um, I used to be troubled by that term, the wilderness of sin. I remember as a young man thinking, wow, that's, that can't be good. <laughs> um, it had to be sinful. Uh, and it has no reference to sin as Paul refer to all have sin and come short of glory. doesn't refer to that. <clears throat> the word sin is the same root we get Sinai from, S-I-N. Um, sin was the Arabian moon god uh, whose name was Ali Allah. Ali Allah. Ali whatever. You can see how that came to be Allah. Oh. And whereas Mohammed um, mentioned Allah was the one true God, all of the references back were of the moon God. And a lot of the nations that are Muslim still have that crescent moon 
on their flags and the words Allah were included in um, many of their names. Mohammed's father had Allah, the first part of his name, the last part of his name, and that was the worship of the moon god. Yes, ma'am. Would they, would they concede to that, that that's who it is, or would they say it? Depends it's... on who you're talking to. <laughs> if you're talking to a um, strict Muslim, they would deny that. But their history is full of it. Full of it. Um, <clears throat> Israel was warned against this early. In Deuteronomy 4, and in Deuteronomy 17, 2 Kings 23, Jeremiah 8, they were warned, do not worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. Why did he say that? Because many of the nations that they passed through, that they uh, scattered around in the land of Canaan, worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. This bunch was worshiping the moon god. And um, they came from a nation that worshiped the sun god called Ra, if you uh, uh, know about that. Uh, they, <clears throat> sometimes Baal was thought of as being the sun god, although he was pictured as a calf, a calf. So all this is kind of connected. The idolatry <clears throat> of the earth is basically one. They have, the names are changed, but they're still all much the same. <clears throat> Jethro, that was Moses' father-in-law, and Moses both refer to the mountain of God. <clears throat> Sinai, which has that moon God connection, they didn't call it that. They called it the mountain of God. And this was in contrast with the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, and the Amalekites who intermingled and dwelt in this area of Arabia. <clears throat> But uh, that's our little deal on the wilderness of sin. Uh, this wilderness is between Elam and Mount Sinai. We see that in 16.1. Uh, the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And uh, we see now they begin to murmur again. Can you believe it? <laughs> Verse 2, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And can you believe what they said? Verse 3, the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger now what have these guys just seen they've seen the water become sweet by a miracle they've seen the Red Sea parted and them that they went across on dry land they, see, they have seen a lot of things that the Lord was able to do. And yet, they murmur against him. Uh, they're going to say some other bad things in the future, as we'll see, too. Yes. Hi. <laughs> I knew if I did this, you couldn't see me. That's um, right. It seems to me that they murmur, and then God takes care of it. It's almost as if they're Pavlov's dogs, um, Murmur, God takes care of it. Murmur, God takes care of it. And so if it were me in those days, maybe I'd murmur so God would take care of it. 
Well, there may be a little bit to that. Let's, let's go on in verse 4. Verse 4, Then the Lord, then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, every day that I may prove them whether they walk in my law or no. And uh, to summarize it, <clears throat> they said the sixth day you go out. Uh, well, they said don't don't gather more than you can eat for a day because if you get up the next morning and try to eat what you had yesterday, it's going to be no good. Okay. But he said, but the sixth day, gather twice the amount because there's not going to be any on the seventh day. That's the Sabbath or Shabbat. And they were not to gather then. And of course you knew that there were some that did not do that. And then they went out and there was nothing on the seventh day. Um, verse 7. In the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. I want us to understand this principle. Murmuring is not against Moses, but it's against God. Scriptural principle. They yelled at Moses. They murmured against Moses. God said, they're not murmuring against you. They're murmuring against me. Do you have complaints? Do you have issues where you don't like where God has put you. You think it's wrong. Why has he done this? And you complain to your relatives, to whatever. You're not dissatisfied with the people that have put you there. You're dissatisfied with God. Because nothing happens that God doesn't allow or God doesn't so order and he does it for our good as he teaches us. So they were without food because God wanted to teach them something. And he did. Um, but that's a scriptural principle. And we need to learn what Paul said that in whatever state I am, and he wasn't talking about just about Florida, okay? <laughs> Wisconsin. Therewith to be content. Some of us are wealthy, some of us are poor. Some of us are healthy, some of us are not. Some of us are have to work like everything to get what we get. Some people it comes easy. Everyone is different. But God is Lord of all. Job said this, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hmm. So God does another miracle. He does the manna. He does the quail. And he does it for 40 years. They never went hungry again. For 40 years, they wandered in, the, we call it wilderness wanderings, but they weren't wandering so much. They were pretty much holed up in Kadesh or Petra at, for that 40 years. God gave them this. <clears throat> And Paul said, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That means God gives a gift, he doesn't take it away. God gives you the gift of faith, salvation, he doesn't take it away. God gave them the food they needed. And although they were unfaithful to him, and although that generation died in the wilderness, 
They never were hungry again. And we'll find out later that their shoes never wore out. And the clothes on their back never wore out. Miracle after miracle after miracle happens. And yet they were not able to enter the land. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 19 says, because of unbelief. We'll see that a little later. Yes? To get back to what Tom said earlier about the plenty, didn't they get quail because they were griping about the manna? <laughs> didn't they get tired of the manna and say they wanted meat? <laughs> I think Scripture says they had so many quail they yeah, I, sick of it. The, um, uh, the one scripture says that there was so many quails that they were like up to three feet off the ground. Um, I have, I'll have to study that again. But I don't think there were quails stacked on top of quails for that. I think they were flying around at three feet and boom, all they had to do was reach out and grab them. They were there. How many of you eaten quail before? Tastes just like chicken. <laughs> How many of you eaten snake before? Tastes just like chicken. <laughs> okay. In uh, back to uh, Exodus 16. In chapter 16, verse 23. He gives them the Sabbath is the command. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Um, he, he gives them this Sabbath day. And it is a thing between Israel and Jehovah from that day on. It is not a thing between the church and the Lord. It is a Jewish thing. Rightly dividing the word. He gave it to them. Okay. Uh, again, we look at the wildernesses. Now, this is the wilderness of sin right here where they were. This is the wilderness of Shur. They're going to go up to the wilderness of Sinai. And these wildernesses, like we said, they run together and they overlap and everything. There are no signposts saying, you are leaving the wilderness of sure and are coming into the wilderness of sin. It doesn't say that. And in many cases, the wilderness of Paran included everything over here. And in some instances, you'll see the wilderness of sure included everything over here. So um, I guess it was depending on who you were talking to at the time as to where, well, what wilderness are we in now? You know, but uh, these are, and see the wilderness of Egypt? That's over in the Sinai Peninsula. That's the wilderness of Egypt because it's an Egyptian territory, not over here. Okay, we're going to start on this. We'll see how far we get. The way to rip them back in uh, Numbers uh, 33, verse 12, it said, And they took their journey out of the wilderness of sin and encamped in Dothkah. Now, that is not listed in Exodus. You see, Dothkah and Osh are not listed in, in, in Exodus. But they are in numbers. Um, so we, we see uh, that they come to these here. Um, Exodus 17 doesn't record those locations. It just talks about them going to Rephidim. But this is the way to Rephidim. Okay, here's the map again. They leave the uh, second Red Sea camp. They go through the wilderness of sin. They go through Doka on day 39, and then they travel through the mountains to Alash, 
Now, Aulis is probably the toughest leg that they had. Um, this valley, which is highway number 8784 today, if you happen to be in Saudi Arabia and you're driving a Jeep or whatever, there's actually a highway there. Uh, but it goes through here to Aulish, and this is, at, at some places, 200 meters wide, very narrow. And you're bringing between 2.5 and 3 million people through there. Uh, and it's, uh, and so what happens is that they, they journeyed by stages. You see this in numbers. Uh, it talks about he sent first the mighty men of Judah went first. I guess they had their swords and stuff, so they went first, and then one by one the uh, tribes followed. So they journeyed in stages to Alish, um, but that was a tough leg. They get to Rephidim, and when they get to Rephidim, a lot of things happen there. Um, <clears throat> they spend days 42 to 46, that's Ocean, or days 70, 17 through 21 from the Red Sea, if you figure from that point, they spend that time in Rephidim. Sometimes you see it referred to as Meribah, um, the, this place called Rephidim. Uh, and guess what? They start murmuring again. <laughs> Go figure. Question. Yes. Where is that on our map? I see that on the chart? Okay. Um, verse, verse 1, chapter 17 of, uh, of Exodus, and all the congregation of the children of Israel journey from the wilderness of sin. After their journey, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses, Give us water that may, we may drink. Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried to the Lord, saying, What shall I do? unto these people, they all be almost ready to stone me. Um, and we'll, we'll see that he didn't give them water right away. He didn't give them water until they got up into the wilderness of Sinai. So, uh, um, but anyway, uh, as, they, um, as they go into the wilderness of Sinai, God performs a miracle at Horeb, Mount Horeb, which is, you know, Mount Sinai, uh, in day 47, Exodus 17, verses 5 through 7, the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, take thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go, and I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, Thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. People may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Uh, well, this whole time they're still getting the manna and the quail, right? Yes, they're still they're so still getting, with us or not. <laughs> wow, we're going to take it up next week. There, um, we're going to see uh, the next thing that happens. They're going to have more miracles other than this water. 
So let me mention the rock that split when Moses struck it gushed forth enough water to feed 2.5 million people. This was just not a, you know, a little water fountain that you turn a knob on it. This, this was a lot of water. This was a lot of water. And it, and it watered them for a good time. We'll get into that next. And uh, we're going to see the children of Israel camp at Mount Sinai next week. And we'll see how uh, Moses made eight ascensions on Mount Sinai. We just think of him going up, getting the law, and coming back. He went up and down that thing eight times. Eight times. Anyway, okay. Let's pray and uh, we'll pick this up next week. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that. You have given us examples in Scripture. Some of them are positive examples. Some of them are negative examples. Things that we should not do. Lord, help us to understand that no matter what we do, you are faithful. And you have a plan for us. And while we sometimes are not faithful to you, you will never fail us. Thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for us. In his name we pray. Amen.